Good morning, my name is Pastor Keith Klippenstein from Territorial Drive Alliance Church, and it is good to be with you for our Good Friday morning service. We are gathering together as congregations from the Battlefords to remember the death of Jesus Christ and the significance that it has on our lives. Easter weekend is the defining weekend in Christianity. What happened on Easter weekend served to define the direction of my life and yours. Today, we will worship God together and remember that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And in these days of worldwide uncertainty, where literally billions of people are looking for hope for the future, our prayer is that the God we worship will reveal himself. As the writer of Psalm 33 says in verse 12 to 15 and verse 22, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Would you bow with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gathering of churches around the battlefields. And I thank you for the shared hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And this weekend, as we remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Father God, we acknowledge that you are the Savior of the world. And we surrender ourselves for you to um, do your work amongst us this weekend. We pray that you would draw our hearts closer to you and draw those who don't know you to yourself. May your hand be upon the service as we worship you, as we remember and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. We have some great worship for you and then a few speakers. And then at the end of the service, we will be celebrating communion together. We would simply ask that you find some juice, some bread, some crackers in your household that you and your family can partake together at the end of the service. God bless you as we worship together. It's good to worship with you this weekend. We are thankful that we can gather together even in this way and just celebrate at what Jesus has done. So let's worship together.
Again, my name is Kevin Mullen, and I'm the lead pastor at Emmanuel Pentecostal Fellowship here in North Battleford. And as we come together today, each of the pastors here have a few minutes to look at part of the great story that was authored by God for the redemption of our sins, to bring humanity back to himself in order to see us forgiven and to be saved. This morning, I will be looking at a section of scripture in Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, so if you have your Bibles or your apps, you can turn there this morning and just follow along this morning. And I'm going to be focusing on the betrayal of Jesus and the abandonment of the disciples at a time where we would think that Christ needed people around him the most. You see, the Bible tells us that the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And we see that here, he even goes after Jesus. He even goes after Jesus through the betrayal of, for, of Judas and through the abandonment of the disciples. So let's pick up the Good Friday story in Matthew chapter 26. The story is relayed in the first three Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I'm going to take a look at Matthew's depiction this morning and how the events took place with him. We see in the first few verses that the plot is hatched by the chief priests of the temple and the elders to get rid of Jesus. You see, they have tried this before, to get rid of Jesus, but now they have got to the point where Jesus is impeding on their influence in society. Basically, Jesus is cramping the style of the elders and the chief priests and the Pharisees. The first point is this. Jesus knew that this was going to happen. Jesus saw it coming and he still carried on with the plan of salvation. He could have called out to God the Father and halted this tragedy, but Christ knew that the only way for us to defeat death and sin was to offer himself as a substitute for us and for our sins. We are made alive in him through his work on the cross. And then we go to Judas. As you follow along in, in, in chapter 26 of Matthew, you see Judas coming into the story clearly now. And you realize that there is a good reason today, in today's day and age, where not many people, if any, ever name their newborn son Judas. The name never comes up on a top 10 baby list that I've ever seen. Because Judas is remembered for the most monumental betrayal in the history of mankind. And we need to remember this though. Jesus picked Judas as one of the twelve. Out of all the people that were on the planet at that time, in that land at that time, when Jesus was there, he picked Judas. Now yes, Jesus knew the prophecies of the Old Testament would need to be fulfilled and that he would be betrayed. But can you imagine actually hand-picking the person who was going to betray you? Yet the plan of salvation was in motion, and Judas was a needed cog in the wheel of the plan. How many of you this morning out there have felt the sting and pain of betrayal some, at some point in your life? To be betrayed is a violation of trust, and a loss of respect, and a turning one's back on a person. Jesus knows that pain that you have gone through this morning. He knows that pain of betrayal because he's felt it. You need to seek God. You need to seek Christ to forgive that person if you're still holding on to that betrayal. Because if you do not, you're not truly living your best life. You're not truly being alive in Christ. Because with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he will bear all of your burdens. He'll bear all of your hurts and he will forgive. The Bible tells us in another depiction of the story that the enemy, Satan, entered into Judas and then looked for a time to carry out the betrayal. Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest followers, one of the twelve. Jesus, in just a chapter before when he's eating the Last Supper with his disciples, he tells Judas that he is the one, the one who will betray him, and then Judas flees into the night. The betrayal of Jesus was the point of no return. There was no turning back for Christ and the plan of salvation that he knew he needed to accomplish. And the thought to run away, to get away from everything, never entered into the mind of Christ. 
because he loves us so much. And all of his teachings, all of his sermons, all of his healings that took place in the first four Gospels where Jesus' life is depicted, they led up to this moment of sacrifice for this, our sins so that we can experience eternal life and real life as we live right now. I can't imagine being betrayed to the extent that Christ was. But I know that Christ saw it coming, and he knew that it was part of the plan of salvation that allows us to enter into a relationship with him and walk with him each and every day that we are given breath. So the betrayal of Christ by Judas, while unquestionably tragic and absolutely shocking, becomes the action that will thrust Christ into the most terrible suffering and pain culminating in his death. But love comes out as the victor. This Good Friday we are remembering Christ's crucifixion, but we remember that Sunday he rose again, and he is the victor. Through Christ's death and resurrection, which we commemorate on Easter Sunday, we see that new covenant ushered in, that we have access to the Father. Through simply offering up a prayer and he want, wanting him to come into our lives as our Lord and our Savior. And that, my friends, I can attest to is something that we can all experience today. So with the betrayal of Christ, and we know that that was a necessary part of the story, we come to the abandonment of the disciples as well. Which includes the disciple Peter's denial of Christ three times. Denied he even knew him. And when you're going through dark times, one thing that you really want and you really need is just someone to talk to. Isn't that right? Someone to talk to, someone to call, text, email, and visit with them or just be there for you. And you know who those people are in your life that you can rely on and you can turn to in times of darkness and need. And we thrive on that. It makes us feel better and it encourages us and we press on. And Jesus Christ was going through his darkest days and his 12 closest friends on the planet abandoned him and left. They fled. Matthew 26, 56 simply tells us all the disciples left him and fled. In a time of great upheaval, they bail on him. Jesus commenced the next part of the tragedy alone. After being betrayed and abandoned, he's on his own. Can you imagine how that must have felt? If it were me, I would have immediately questioned my choice of friends. Yet it didn't faze him. Nothing changed in his plan. Jesus was now on his way to a trial on bogus charges, which led to the cross. The betrayal of Judas and the abandonment of the disciples were events that were part of the plan. The plan that Christ has for us to redeem him, redeem us to himself through the shedding of his blood on the cross for the redemption of our sins. You see, we can't experience eternal life without Jesus going to the cross. And remember this, and hold fast to this truth, is that Christ will never betray, and he will never abandon you. He loves you with an unconditional love and wants to come to you, wants you to come to him for redemption, so that you may truly, truly live. So right now we're going to listen to Pastor Keith Klippenstein as he unpacks some truths about the arrest of Jesus Christ on the same night, Good Friday. The betrayal of Jesus was soon followed by his arrest. When we read the Gospels, we are given plenty of advance warning that this day would eventually come. The religious leaders of Jerusalem had been scheming this day for, oh, quite some time, and clearly intended to put an end to Jesus' life. And now that they had their prime opportunity, they were not going to let him slip out of their hands. So they advanced to the place called Gethsemane. And we understand that a large crowd with swords and clubs along with the religious officials and a detachment of soldiers, came upon Jesus. This appears to be a well-orchestrated arrest, leaving no room for escape. If there ever was a portrayal of human might to corner Jesus, this would have been the time. And while Jesus had only moments before prayed to his Father, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will, we are soon convinced that this event was not as it appears to be, where the powers of evil, the authority of man, has exercised their superiority at last. 
What we find here, as one writer said, is a commanding figure who was in charge of the events that were transpiring against him. The writer John writes with complete confidence that Jesus knew everything that was about to happen. And we read in John chapter 18, starting at verse 4. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you, I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup? The Father has given me. And Jesus steps toward the crowd with the question, who is it that you want? We see here not a man in fear of his enemies. We see Jesus volunteering himself what was in his Father's will. And when their reply specifically is Jesus of Nazareth, we come to terms that this is truly a historical account of a man who was raised as a boy in a well-known town, whose father was Joseph, whose mother was Mary. Jesus, well-known to those in his community, the surrounding region, and well-known to the, to the nation by now. So well-known that the way he lived his life and the following that he drew caused the leading authorities to be threatened. When Jesus replies, I am he, we witness the proof of really who is in charge on this evening. What do we see? As he said those words, they drew back and fell to the ground. The might of human authority was toppled in a mere moment. It was explained to me this way. The all-powerful God was put in shackles, while the angels that witnessed the power of God at creation stood by in the awe of restrained power. Those angels stood by and watched as their Lord was treated with contempt. With one word of permission, they would have come in legions and wiped out this tiny portrayal of human strength. And God revealed, re restrained himself to allow the shackles to be placed on his son. That power, John 18, 6, caused all humans to fall back to the ground. How could mere man stand up to the might and the strength of God who formed the whole universe? And with all this might, with all this power, Jesus restrained himself. He resolved himself to go through with the plan, to drink the cup that his father had placed before him. Well, the wonder is no longer the shackles, but the sheer immensity of the power that was restrained for us. Ultimately, the father, leading his son to pay the price of the sin of the whole world, given his infinite grace. Then in a moment of brash impulse, Peter, who had a sword in his hand, swings it and cuts off the servant of the high priest's ear, likely aiming to do much more damage. And in a display of the power that was being restrained, Jesus reaches over and restore that man's ear and says to Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter, this is something I must do. We ask the question, why was Jesus so resolved to do his Father's will when he knew what that cup meant? We read in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him.
My topic today is the trial that Jesus faced that resulted in him being condemned to death on the cross. The events of that night began with Jesus facing the first of six trials that he would face over the course of the night and early morning. Six trials in the course of eight hours. There are several things that you need to be take note of. Each and every one of these six trials was illegal according to the Roman and the Jewish law. The events of Good Friday should never have taken place but they were all part of God's divine plan. Take note also that there were three Jewish trials and each one of them condemned Jesus and three Roman civic trials and they found Jesus innocent. But in the end, Jesus was condemned to death. After Jesus was arrested, he was taken to the first trial, which was in front of Annas. This time of the trial was in the wee hours of the morning. The trial before Annas is found in John chapter 18, verses 12 to 14 and 19 to 23 include the details of that first trial. Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. In John chapter 18, starting in verse 12, it says, Then the band and the captains and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, and he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, which was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was he which had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. In verse 24, it says, and Annas sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. This trial was illegal in first that it was held at night, starting around 2 a.m., and secondly, Jesus did not have any legal counsel and would not offer a lawyer. The second trial that night took place at approximately 3.30 a.m., taking place before the high priest. This trial before Caiaphas is found in all four Gospels in Matthew 26, verses 57 to 68, Mark chapter 14, verses 53 to 65, Luke chapter 22 verses 45 to 65 and John chapter 18 verses 24 with Matthew offering the most details. In the second trial the religious leaders gathered together and brought many false witnesses against Jesus. Matthew 26 starting in verse 57 and they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest which were the scribes and the Pharisees were assembled. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At last came two false witnesses, and they said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy, which further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, now that we have heard his blasphemy, what think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. And they spat on his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophecy, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is it that smote thee? Smote thee? As with the previous trial, this was held at night. There was no legal counsel was provided for Jesus. And according to the rules of the court, the Jewish trial stated that the individual members of the court should vote independently, and they voted as a single group. The tr third trial took place at 6 a.m. Like the other trials, it was illegal in that it was held in the middle of the night. There was no legal counsel, and the Sanhedrin voted as a group, and the rules of the court said that the priest could not speak in defense, could speak in the defense of a person, but not present evidence against him. This Jewish trial before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling high court, all three synoptic gospels record this in Matthew 27, 1, Mark 15, 1, and Luke 2267 through 71. Luke 2266 says, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes gathered together and led him into the council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe me. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit at the right hand of the power of God. Then say they all, Art thou the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, We have no further need of any witness, for we ourselves have heard it of his own mouth. At this point, the Roman leader in Palestine, Pontius Pilate, became involved. The Jews wanted Christ to be crucified, but the Jewish courts lacked any authority to condemn a person to death. They had to be to get the Romans to do their dirty work. They needed the authority of Rome to have Jesus condemned to death. In Luke 23, verse 1, it says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. They changed the charges against Jesus away from the religious charges of blasphemy and moved to civic charges that would get him get the Romans to act. The time of this trial was 6.30 a.m. 
Luke 23, 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding the giving of tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. This was the equivalent of being branded a domestic terrorist in those days. And Pilate answered, asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Pilate found no fault. Matthew 23, verse 5. And they were more fierce, saying, He stirred up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning with the Gentiles in this place. When Pilate heard of the Gentile of Galilee, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged into Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was at Jerusalem at this time. As soon as Pilate heard that Jesus was a Galilean, he saw a political out, and he shipped Jesus off to Herod. Time for this trial was 7 a.m. The trial before Herod is re only recorded in Luke chapter 23, verses 6 through 12. Herod had hoped to see a miracle, and thought, though Jesus answered none of the charges against him, Herod and his men mocked Jesus and sent him back to Pilate in a kingly robe. In verse 20, chapter 23, verse 11, it says, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him to Pilate. The third Roman trial, Jesus was sent back to Pilate for the last of the trials. This took place at 7.30 a.m. It had been a very long night for Jesus. The second trial before Pilate, all four Gospels record the trial. Matthew in chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 18. In the end, Pilate claimed that he had nothing to do with the punishment of Jesus. Luke 23, starting in verse 13, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, Ye have brought me this man unto me, as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and found no fault in this man, touching these things which he is accused of. This should have been the end of the whole sordid affair, but it was not to be. It was a tradition that each year at the Passover, the Roman governor, Pilate, would release a prisoner as a goodwill gesture to the Jewish people. At this time, Pilate abdicated his responsibility and left the decision to the mob. Matthew 27, starting in verse 17. Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom would you, you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called the Christ? And the governor said, What evil has this man done? But they called out more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but would rather a turmoil would be made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And they answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Three times the Romans attempted to release Jesus but they let political expediency get in the way of doing the right thing. But regardless, it was necessary for Jesus, the Son of God, to be tried and convicted to die on the cross, so that the God's plan of salvation could be fulfilled. God's plan called for Jesus to be the Passover lamb, the sacrifice for the redemption of sins. Ultimately, the trials and death of Jesus were illegal according to both Jewish and Roman law. It was a mockery of our perfect and sinless Messiah. But God's plan of salvation had to be fulfilled. And that brings us to the very last trial. This is the trial that takes place today, where you are the judge. Was Jesus what he said he was? The Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Passover Lamb, your Savior and Redeemer. Your decision has eternal consequences. What are you going to do with Jesus? Thank you. Hello, my name is Wayne Wagner. I pastor Mooseman Native Fellowship Church. And I was asked to preach for this Good Friday service on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so I was thinking about Matthew chapter 27, verses 24 to 37. So I'm going to, to read that. Um, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered his, answered, his blood be on us and on our children. 
Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered, gathered the whole battalion before him. And twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took a reed and, and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. As they went out, they found a, a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, that compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to, to drink mixed with, with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And, and when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over, and over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. And so the reason why I want to read this passage is because it's it's just a, a real good, clear um, portion of scripture that outlines what Jesus endured um, for for the crucifixion and and the scourging and everything like that. And so um but I, just to talk a little about uh everything that leads up to this you know everything that that leads up to the crucifixion is anything but good and yet it is referred to as good friday jesus is betrayed and abandoned left to stand alone his apostles you know uh scripture says that once the shepherd was struck the, the sheep, the sheep, uh, you know, abandoned him. And so um, for him to face all this on his own, um, being betrayed by one of his own, Judas, and yet, and, and then on top of that, the spotless sin of lamb being placed in shackles, arrested unjustly, uh, he endured an unjust trial. And after all that, he is scorched. In verse 26, it talks, talks about how he's scorched, which is like just a, a horrible um, form of uh, torture. And then verse 27 to 31 tells of how he endured um the mocking, the beating, the thorns being pushed into his head, um, how they mocked him, hail king of the Jews, spitting on him and beating him. Um, Jesus endured all of this. Um, even in, endured being crucified on the cross. As we read this portion of scripture, we are reminded of our Savior who endured the suffering. And then you might ask, well, why did he endure it? Why did he, why did he endure all of this? Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He was looking to the joy that was set before him. And then you ask, well, what was the joy? What was the joy in all of this? But he wasn't looking at those specific circumstances, but he was looking beyond his circumstances to the coming joy, being seated at the right hand of the Father in eternity, um, bringing the the joy of bringing his his uh, his followers into a relationship with him. G the sin was paid for by the death by the death of Jesus Christ. He died that we may live. The full price was paid in order to bring us to God. The veil was torn in two that we would have full access to the holy place, the presence of God, to be in the presence of God, 
That is a very good thing that he has done. And so as I think about the suffering of Jesus, as I think of what he endured, um, I know some people may say, well, other people have suffered. People have been tortured. People have died for good reasons. But the thing is, is this is God. This is God of the universe who created everything, the sun, the moon, the stars. He created everything. He created the earth. He gives us life every single day. And he became a man born in a manger, lived a humble life. And he was humble all the way to the point of the cross. Who of us is willing to come down from our lofty places to do such such a thing? But Jesus shows such a perfect example, the humble Savior. And then as I think about how glorious he is in doing such a thing, I just think it's absolutely amazing. So I want you to confront yourself with the holiness of God, the goodness of Jesus Christ, and it will drive you to your knees. And that is exactly where a follower of Jesus Christ ought to be, on their knees, in adoration of the Holy One, the Good One, Jesus Christ, who died for your sins. And so I think of the goodness of, of, of Good Friday truly is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ alone. He is the good one. He is our Lord and our Savior. And I pray that you are blessed by this message. God bless you all as you celebrate Good Friday. God bless. We've come to that time in our service where we are going to join together and partake of communion with one another in a virtual sense. And I trust that you already have your emblems ready in front of you to be able to do this with us. I just want to share a few thoughts before we partake of the emblems together. We've heard messages about the experience that Christ has had uh, coming towards that time where they took him to the hill of the skull and put him up on the cross. And leading towards that uh, in John chapter 6 we saw that Jesus talked about how people needed to um, eat of his flesh and drink of his blood and those that do that abide in him it says that in John 6 uh, verse 56 and then in verse 60 disciples, some of his disciples said, this is a hard saying. Years ago, I read this book called The Other Jesus by John Ogilvy, and in it, he he wrote about the hard sayings of Jesus, and one of the hard sayings was this one, where he said to eat of his blood and drink of his flesh, and indeed, like I I just read, um, he said this was a hard saying. He believed that it was a saying that signified, I want you to give every fiber of my being, every fiber of your being, to me. And that is a hard saying. We all struggle with trying to give our all to Jesus. And yet, Jesus going through the arrest, going through the trial, going through the floggings, going through the crucifixion. He gave us every fiber of his being. He led in the way that he said that we needed to follow him. He didn't hold anything back from us. And so as we take up the emblems today, I want you to think about the price that was paid I want to think about, I want you to think about what we can do during this time to commit ourselves to more fully following Christ. So we take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. 
Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this body is for me. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Paul goes on to say in verse 25, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for the body and for the blood. We thank you that you gave every fiber of your being, that you desired to show your love for us in such a great way. It's beyond our comprehension, Lord. But we thank you for it. We thank you for the salvation that it brought. We thank you for the body that was broken, for the stripes that were laid on your body that brought healing, that brought the healing of our souls and the healing of our bodies. Lord, we thank you for your blood that washes whiter than snow. Lord, we are cleansed by your blood. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't take this for granted. Lord, that it would draw us closer to you and speak your grace and your mercy into our lives each day. It would come fresh to us each day. Now, Lord, we pray that as we go our separate ways, Lord, as we come towards the celebration of Sunday, as we remember how you rose from the grave, Lord, may we find fresh blessing in that as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you for being with us for this time, and we hope that uh, you will have a very blessed resurrection weekend and that you will uh, just consider what was said today within the different messages and let it speak to your heart, speak to your soul, and speak to your mind. And may you be blessed by it and blessed by God. God bless you. Have a great day. And uh, reach out and, and touch somebody through, through some calls. And uh, have a great day. Bye-bye. Hello, it's Pastor Kevin again. I trust that you enjoyed our online Good Friday service. And if you do need to contact any of the pastors or leadership of the churches involved, the contact information will follow this. I pray that you'll all have a wonderful Easter weekend and God bless.